The city of Victoria, that's this part of Victoria, is making some major changes to its official community plan. As of the publishing of this video, we are in the public input stage. Today, I'm going to talk about what the plan means for housing, land use, and transportation. We will also talk about what your input means to the city, when it is considered, and when it is not, and why sometimes ignoring people's views is actually a good thing. You choose to subsidize golf courses, and everything unpleasant that people associate with multifamily housing. Perimeter blocks are awesome. Most people can't even tell where Victoria ends. This is a bicycle crossing. There is no need to tear down some of our most productive and affordable buildings. Take a look at this diagram intended to represent the trade-offs governments have to make. It is impossible to have stable services, low taxes, and low density. You must choose higher taxes, service cuts, or more density. I know which one I'd pick. If you are Ogbe, you'd choose to subsidize golf courses and mansions at unbelievably low tax rates, thinking your quaint little rich people enclave should do just fine. Low taxes and low density means service cuts. And Oak Bay is at the height of a decades-long infrastructure deficit, incapable of maintaining their crumbling roads, many of which probably date back to the 1950s. So, we've established that you cannot have all three. Keep this in mind as we'll come back to it. Let's have a quick look at Victoria's description of why the official community plan matters. We're updating Victoria's official community plan to meet the needs of our growing population and address the housing and climate crises. The official community plan, also known as the OCP, is a big deal. It's the long-term plan that guides where housing, businesses, and public spaces should go and how we move around the city. And we have a solid understanding of what Victoria values and needs from years of public feedback, technical analysis, current city policy, and through the creation of plans like Go Victoria, the Climate Leadership Plan, Parks and Open Spaces Master Plan, and Victoria 3.0. Now is the time to talk about how to bring those values to life as our city grows and changes. You can have your say by taking the OCP survey, attending an open house, visiting us at a pop-up event, or attending a lunch and learn session. Learn more about the OCP and upcoming engagement opportunities and take the survey at engage.victoria.ca slash OCP. In this video, the city makes it very clear that Victoria will continue to change no matter what, and it's our responsibility to ensure that change makes the city better, not worse. Many people have complained that the survey is biased and doesn't leave room for objecting to the idea of increasing density entirely, or that there are no places to ask for more parking. On this, I will refer to Councillor Dave Thompson's blog post about the survey. The OCP survey is just one part of a much larger engagement process. You have other ways and other opportunities to provide input. In terms of housing, Victoria has existing commitments, provincial direction, and, might I add, a wealth of international knowledge on what makes our cities better places to live. As such, the OCP will not be considering whether we add housing, but rather how and where we add housing, and a lot of it. I'd just like to interject for a moment. It's been making the news that Victoria has already exceeded the province's housing targets that have been set for the city. While this is true, these targets are extremely low, and they are designed more to determine whether other municipalities are going to get on the housing naughty list. Oak Bay is scrambling to build even 500 units of housing, whereas Victoria already had that in the pipeline. There is no value in public input that asks for the city to do all three. We must choose service cuts, high taxes, or more density. Increasing the supply of housing enough will reduce the cost of housing. This is something we need to do anyways. Increasing density is the most sustainable way to add housing to the city, <coughs> well, sure, and brings more people closer together, reducing vehicle kilometers traveled, and making sustainable transportation more convenient. I think my audience generally agrees with this, so I'm not going to explain this any further. If you want more information on housing, check out some of the resources that I have linked in the description. So yes, I said it. The City of Victoria's official community plan survey is biased towards change because we cannot have all three. They are not asking, do you want to change? They are asking, how should we change? And obviously, density is the best option to do this. And I am happy with the City of Victoria staff choosing to be clear and proud about this.
Now, let's talk about some key areas of the OCP and where they could be improved. So, for the above reasons and more, we want to allow more housing. And to make sure this housing actually gets built, we need a fast, predictable process. The most important thing you need to know about OCPs is that all municipalities in BC must have one, and the Local Government Act empowers them to change their zoning at any time to match what is described in the OCP. For years, Victoria's zoning has not matched the OCP. Fortunately, due to recent provincial housing policy changes, the city will eventually be updating their zoning to match the new OCP that we're creating here. This plan can ultimately change the base zoning citywide and radically simplify the way we zone our city into a consistent, predictable set of guidelines that are easier for developers to conform to, rather than bashing their head against the wall with the rezoning process over and over again. The city has two serious proposals, one which is clearly more ambitious. First things first though, there are a couple exceptions to these designations. Local villages, community villages, town centers, the downtown core, and a couple other districts will have their own rules. Local and community villages mostly surround existing clusters of old affordable buildings that already provide valuable business spaces. Creating incentives to build elsewhere, or increasing the allowed building size so much that redeveloping these buildings is actually worthwhile, is an important decision. There's no need to tear down some of our most productive and affordable buildings when they sit in a sea of single-family homes. And this is what makes me so excited about both of these plans. Staff want to allow small business spaces everywhere under the base zoning. All of our existing little village centers happened many years ago before strict zoning was put in place. The location of Cook Street Village, Fernwood Corners, Haltane Corners were not handed down on two stone tablets. They just naturally clustered in places where people had a need for a neighborhood business of some sort. Now, some of you might be wondering, does it make sense to allow anything anywhere? When you take the OCP survey, you'll get to look at this story map of Victoria's assets, like transportation, businesses, public services, and so on. When you layer all of these together, you get a map that says, yes, it makes sense to build housing basically anywhere, because it's a compact city. We have everything within a short distance. A neighborhood association that shall not be named, according to this blog post, links in the description, said that the OCP doesn't respect the city's diverse nature or context in the CRD. Yes, every neighborhood has a somewhat unique feel, but the height and size of the buildings isn't the number one thing that defines this. If you gave them more creative freedom to work with instead of subjecting them to design reviews that always make them turn out like this, developers would be very good at evoking the local context with a building. But let's not kid ourselves. Most people can't even tell where Victoria ends and Saanich, Oak Bay, or Esquimalt begins. As far as context within the CRD goes, concentrating our growth in Victoria and lower municipalities, and keeping growth out of the West Shore and Peninsula is an important sustainability strategy to fight car dependence, loss of farmland, and loss of forests. Sorry West Shore peeps, I know you are doing everything that you can to make this car-infested hellscape more livable. But at the end of the day, most people only choose to move here because it's cheaper. This is something I keep in mind when thinking about Victoria's future housing. It's not enough to house people who already live here. We should be building so much fucking housing that it is cheaper to live in Victoria than in the periphery. Approach number two, the ambitious proposal would allow six story buildings almost everywhere with some caveats. At first, I thought, wow, this is truly the next generation of housing, like the four-story wood frame apartments we built throughout the city last century. In the past, Jubilee was mostly single-family homes, and now, much of it looks like this. If we hadn't done this, the housing market would be much worse today. This next generation of six-story buildings everywhere could not only house people within Victoria, but welcome back families in the region that have been cast in exile to the West Shore. However, the caveats to approach number two are huge. Only purpose-built rentals can build at six stories. Let's remember, condos are also housing that people live in. And their floor space ratio would be limited to 2.0 FSR. Floor space ratio is a measure of how much building area there is compared to the land. Cities love to punish efficient land use through arbitrary FSR restrictions instead of just defining the end form of the buildings. Another caveat, buildings with units for sale would be limited to three-story ground-oriented forms. In other words, the MMHI. 
The Missing Mental Housing Initiative has not been very successful just because of how restrictive it is, and I can't imagine this new ground-oriented form is going to be that different. These are nice forms of housing that play an important role in our city, but in order to increase the supply of housing at a reasonable pace that we need right now, these are simply not going to be enough. The less ambitious plan, approach number one, using this ground-oriented form as the floor, effectively leaves vast suburban areas of the city untouched for no good reason. Ironically, this plan theoretically allows more six-story condos by adding the urban residential category, but it drastically limits the places where a six-story rental can be built. So, the less ambitious plan stinks. Who would have thought? So in terms of housing, there are a few key things that the city could do better in the OCP. And given the direction that staff and council are taking, this is input that absolutely will be considered. So personally, I have three requests. Number one, increase the FSR limits in accordance with what developers and housing policy experts believe is feasible, or do away with FSR limits entirely and move to form-based code. Two, allow all forms of tenure, that's rental, condo, etc., to build up to six stories everywhere through approach number two. Number three, remove side setbacks and encourage a perimeter block style typology. So I highly encourage you to advocate for the first two points when you take the survey. Now the third one is also extremely beneficial, but I think it deserves an explanation first because it probably sounds very contentious. In one of the OCP engagement documents, when justifying why they wanted to allow taller buildings, city staff said that without going taller, you would get, quote, bulkier buildings set closer to each other, end quote, which means less outdoor space. This is absolute nonsense, and I just have to explain why. This is what North American development looks like as you get, quote, bulkier buildings. This is what city staff are trying to avoid. And this is what perimeter block style development looks like. Side setbacks blast useful green space into useless smithereens. Use the land efficiently and you can have the benefits of going wider and taller, really making room for more housing without any downsides. I suspect you care more about your backyard than the alley where you put your recycling bins, right? Everything unpleasant that people associate with multifamily housing has to do with the fact we have confined them to busy roads, double-loaded corridors, and single-aspect units that don't get any cross-ventilation or sunlight. Now that BC is moving to legalize point access blocks, combine this with Victoria's ambitious zoning and perimeter blocks, and you could walk up a bright staircase to a wonderful family-sized unit with the bedrooms on the courtyard side. Now, I suspect you will have one other concern. What about privacy? I don't want a window directly at my fence. And this is why, without side setbacks, new developments would actually make better neighbors than they do now. When every building does side setbacks, they go galley style and the units are facing sideways. When every new building does no side setbacks, they orient their windows to the street and to the courtyard, thus preserving the real useful open space. So yeah, perimeter blocks are awesome. They have been done for millennia, and they're the future of efficient land use in Victoria. Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to make that into a separate video. So, we've looked at what Victoria's plans for housing are and how they can be improved. There are many other areas to the OCP, and I encourage you to check them out. But to wrap up this video, let's have a look at how it addresses transportation. As far as expanding the All Ages and Abilities Mobility Network, the OCP is unambitious. Weaving together a continuous network, but mostly through traffic calmed side streets, which traverse the real roads using intersections where people walking and cycling have the right of way. Quick interjection about bike crossings. People do not understand how these work. This is a pedestrian crossing. This is a bicycle crossing. See the bicycle on the sign? Take a look at this map of Victoria's planned network according to the OCP. Aside from Pandora East, most of the AAA priority network has already been built. The expanded network in light green has mostly not been built, but some are in progress, and you can see that most of these are also side streets. 
Capital Bike is pushing the city to be more ambitious, and this is one area of the OCP where I think your input is really needed. One of the reasons Victoria has been avoiding main streets is bus stops. Given the province's recent direction on how to do floating bus stops that is now safe for everyone, I would like to see the city focus on plugging the real gaps in our cycling network, major streets, and doing so with wide, fully protected cycle paths that have properly designed protected intersections. So today we talked about the OCP, why it matters, what kind of public input the city is looking for, how the OCP relates to housing, how it relates to cycling, and some things that I personally think you should advocate for. To recap, those things are 1. Reduce or remove FSR limits. 2. Allow six stories for condos, not just for rentals. 3. Remove side setbacks and move to a perimeter block form. 4. Build cycling infrastructure on major streets. 5. Make those cycling paths wide, comfortable, and fully protected at intersections. Thank you very much for watching. I can't wait to see how much better Victoria will become with your help.